I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to Scripture and Tradition. We are going to be dealing with a whole number of your questions and comments, and we'd love to have you as part of it by sending us your questions by email, writing to Scripture and Tradition at EWTN, or by following us and participating with the show on Facebook and YouTube. But we want to get to answering some of your emails because we, you have a lot of questions and I just don't get a chance to get to all of them on the, the, a lot of the programs. And this show was envisioned to help you get closer to the Lord through the study of sacred scripture and prayer. And in that process, we all have a lot of questions that we want answers for. And you've been great to send us your questions, so I want to take care of that. Again, it's writing to scripture and tradition at EWTN.com. So let's take a look at some of those questions. I'm going to start off with one from Daniel. Uh, he says, Dear Father Mitch, I'm a fairly new Catholic and am in need of some clarification on the power of Mary and the saints. I have no doubt that all the heavenly beings are praying for us earthly beings, but I'm hesitant to pray to them because I'm not sure they are able to hear my prayers. Isn't it true that only God is all-present, all-knowing, and all-powerful? It seems to me that He is the only one who is capable of hearing and responding to millions of requests at any given moment in time. Do Mary and the saints truly have this kind of power? Well, one of the, Daniel, that, that's a very important question. And one of the things that we should pay attention to in the book of Revelation, uh, there's a couple passages. One of them is in chapter 5, that when John sees the vision of the uh, of heaven and he sees the lamb on his throne and how he taken up the scroll with the seven seals that nobody but he could open and that the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb this is in revelation chapter 5 verse 8 and it, when it describes these uh, 24 uh, elders and the four living creatures, each was holding a harp and with golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So our prayers are like these nuggets of incense. And then similarly, along that same line, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 3, it mentions that another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to mingle with all the with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense rose with the prayers of the saints from the hand of the angel. So here we have the incense is uh, compared to the prayers of of the saints and the role of the saints in that case is to offer that incense now the, uh, I've explained this a number of times over the years but I, it, it bears repeating incense when you get it in nugget form smells good but the aroma is fully released when you set it on fire. That's why the angel took the uh, incense and put it on fire on the altar of incense in heaven. So that's one of the things going on there. And the same thing with our prayers, that the prayers that we have are sweet smelling like nuggets of incense, but the saints in heaven 
release the aroma because they're so close to God and to his altar of incense in heaven that they release it. Now, as far as whether the saints know what's going on here on earth, that's another passage from Revelation. If you take a look at Revelation chapter 6, verse 5, um, well, let's not start with five. Let's go down a little bit. Um, verse nine. When the angel opened the fifth seal, or when, the, excuse me, the lamb opened the fifth seal on that scroll, okay, there, there are seven seals. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. So these he sees the souls of the martyrs. These are the martyrs that he sees. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true. They address God. And this is a key element of the intercession of the saints. They speak to God. So, O sovereign Lord, holy and true. How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth. And this means that they are aware of what's going on on earth. They know the things happening there. And it says that they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. And this is an indication that they know what's happening on earth. So on one hand, you are absolutely correct. Only God is infinite and only an omniscient, that is knowing all things. But the saints in heaven know a lot of what's going on. Just think of ourselves. We in the modern world know a lot about what's happening all over the planet in a way that we never could before just by watching the news. Does that mean that the saints know everything and they hear every single prayer? That I don't know. But because there is neither time nor space in heaven, they know an awful lot more than we would if uh, uh, here on earth. And we know a lot more than we used to, but we don't know everything. I suspect that the saints know way more because of the lack of time and space. And they are able to receive lots of petitions. Now, again, as we see in Revelation 5, 8, they receive those petitions like a golden bowl of incense. And are they aware of each and every one? I don't know that. But do they receive that aggregate of uh, petitions, the prayers of the saints from earth? Yes. And do they set them on fire before God? Yes. And release the aroma and the power of those prayers? Yes. But it's still God who answers the prayers. So we should seek their intercession and, you know, uh, ask them for help. Uh, this is a scriptural point, and uh, I highly recommend it, highly recommend it. Saints have been very, very helpful to me. All right, let's now go to another one from Joe. He says, Father Mitch, in Luke 11, 14 to 23, Jesus expels the demon, and the Pharisees accuse him of being in league with the devil. Jesus mentions that they perform exorcisms. What is the history of Jew, Jewish exorcisms? What historical documents do we have? Where did the Jews get their authority to perform exorcisms? Joe, uh, first of all, um, I don't have all those sources on me uh, at this point, but there are a number of places that talk about Jewish exorcists, and it's uh, even some of the, uh, in later times, Muslims would ask for Jewish exorcists in some cases. 
Uh, the, it, exorcism is not something that uh, the mullahs do much of, but people would ask for Jewish exorcists to pray for them. Um, I remember when I was at the town of Bet She'an, no, no, not Bet She'an, Bet Shemesh, Bet Shemesh, uh, down in uh, west of, uh, southwest of Jerusalem a bit. Uh, they, that was a town that had once been very famous for its Jewish exorcists. And if you look up Bet Shemesh uh, in later centuries, you can see that uh, that was one of the traditions there. And then um, it's not only a Lord who mentions it, but in s some of the Jewish sources mention it, the, the exorcists as well. Their authority would come from uh, their uh, use of scripture, the love of God, and their obedience to God. Um, and if you also recall, there's another place in Acts of the Apostles where uh, there are some Jews who tried to exercise, exercise, and they tried to use the name of Jesus, but because they weren't, they, they didn't have a relationship of faith with Jesus, when they called on him, the demons beat them up. Uh, Skeva was, as a matter of fact, I can look up that passage uh, in Acts of the Apostles. Um, uh, let's see, where is that there? Uh, I'm having trouble getting into this program, but I'll... Uh, I'll look it, look it up here. Yes, S C E V A uh, Skeva. It, it only his name only occurs. Well, it's Acts nineteen. He was um, a priest named Skeva, and his seven sons were doing exorcisms, and the evil spirit answered them, "Jesus, I know, and Paul, I know, but who are you?" And then they got beaten up and stripped of their clothes. So that's uh, in Acts 19, verse 14, okay? Uh, begins verse 11, goes on. So that would be uh, worth noting as well, okay? All right, let's now go over to Chris. And Chris says, Dear Father Packwell, my church only has confession for one hour a week. Saturday mornings from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. My work schedule makes it hard to get there, but sometimes I arrive at 11.15. Once in a great while, the priest is still there, and if I'm very lucky, he will hear my confession. However, most of the time, he's gone before I get there. So I go away and read the Divine Office, Liturgy of the Hours, and the Sanctuary. About once every three months, I take off work so I can go to confession. I miss the old days when there were far more hours allotted for confession. We have two priests, but they're both very busy with various groups and meetings. I know the priest told me I really need, only need to go to confession once a year and only for mortal sins, but I miss the old days. Chris. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, the, the pastor is, um, you know, is, and, and the other priests are, are very, very busy. Um, but I think we priests do need to place a priority on the importance of confession. This is a great gift, and we very much need to uh, be ready to hear them. Um, if you can, uh, maybe ask the priest, you know, to wait that extra 15 minutes for you. Um, you know, it's, uh, um, again, I'm, I don't want to impose on his schedule. I don't know his schedule and whether he has weddings and things like that. But uh, sometimes if you make uh, an arrangement to meet with him, that can also work. Uh, some parishes have confessions for longer times and more, more days. Uh, we here at the EWTN, we, we, have it, we have enough friars and they're able to hear confessions every day. So, uh, but perhaps the other option would be, uh, if, if you have this as an option, to maybe try a neighboring parish, see when their confessions are. Uh, you know, the bare minimum is once a year, but, you know, a lot of us, you know, myself included, 
need to go to confession more often. Uh, I, I need to, uh, it's not that I just have to do mortal sins. I want to confess the uh, venial sins because I don't want the sins to sort of get excused or something and for me to give myself permission for lesser sins uh, because it might lead to more serious ones. So yeah, I, I need to go often. And I, I try to I try to get there every week or ten days, so this is a good thing. And you may just have to try uh, another parish, see if they have confession at another time too. Uh, I wish it were different, but we just don't. I remember when I was a kid, it'd be four priests at a time hearing confessions for a couple hours every Saturday, uh, once in the afternoon, once in the evening. And that's what they did on Saturday evening. Um, but again, there's so many other things going on, sometimes hard. So try to work with the priest best you can and get over there to confession. Okay. Um, I have an email from Patricia who comes from New Jersey. Dear Father Mitch, some of my friends think it's okay to receive Holy Communion after they've missed Mass and haven't gone, been to confession for many years. One friend told me she was watching Mass on TV. My problem is discerning whether or not to push her to attend Mass in person. Since she would likely receive communion, it would be better for her to stay home rather than receiving while not in a state of grace. Patricia. Ooh, well, this is... Yeah, it, it would be better for her to do two things, to be present at Mass and not to receive communion until she gets to confession. Now, this would take a, a, a good, serious conversation with her. Um, she should be at Mass, uh, unless, of course, she's an invalid. But if she's, if she's not homebound for some reason or sick, then she should be at Mass personally, present, physically, even if she doesn't receive Holy Communion. She should still be there. And secondly, she should go to confession too. Um, missing Mass on Sunday is not something that's, well, Mass on Sunday is sort of an extra. No, it's not an extra. Uh, the, we, we, that's not that. And well, gosh, you're grateful that I at least watched it on TV. Yeah, he's, that's good. But he expects us to be there. It would be akin to, especially for, you know, uh, dealing with some of the holidays. Remember back at Christmas, and it'd say, okay, I'll just watch the family eat their Christmas dinner on TV. I'll, I'll get them on YouTube live, and they'll be eating a beautiful Christmas dinner with all the trimmings and wonderful, wonderful desserts, and I'd just sit there and watch. And it'd be like me being there, won't it? No, it won't. You know, part of being at Mass is like being at a family reunion where you're there with your family, you talk to your family, you tell jokes with them and tell stories and you enjoy the, 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 actual, the, the actual food not just watch other people eat. You might try that in talking to her. Um, that would be a good idea. And um, I'll never forget one time there was an older Italian grandmother who would send everybody off to mass, but she wouldn't go. She said, I'll stay home and I'll cook the meal. I'll make the gravy and the pasta. You all go to church. And so I said to her, get the family to do this. Go to her house for the Sunday dinner. And then after she serves up a great big plate of food, everybody scatter and go to their own bedrooms, the living room, the den, scatter to all the different rooms of the house and eat your dinner separate from her. And I, I guarantee you 
she will object strenuously. Hey, I made this pasta for you. I want you to eat and enjoy. I said, as soon as she reacts that way, tell her this. Jesus wants to see you at his table. He doesn't want everybody scattered in their own place. You be there together. Just like that grandma would want everybody in the family to sit and enjoy her beautiful meal together. And she wants to watch them and enjoy them. You're not done. Here's some more. Let me give you some more. I, that's the joy of such a great cook to share the food. But you don't let Jesus do that? with giving you his body and blood. Yours is a nice recipe. Jesus gives us himself, and he's God. And you're saying, no, nah, I don't need to be there for it. No, use that kind of argument that may help them get a picture of why it's so important to be there at Mass, okay? All right, let me take a break. We'll come back with more of your questions, so please stay with us. Right, before we get back to your emails, I want you to mark your calendars for July 17th to 21st next year, where you can join EWTN in Indianapolis, Indiana, for the National Eucharistic Congress. It's a movement to restore understanding and devotion to the Holy Eucharist here in the United States, and you can be part of it. You can find out more and receive a code for discounted registration worth almost $80 by going to EWTN.com slash Eucharist. EWTN.com slash Eucharist. Hopefully you'll be, you have a chance to be there. Okay? And by the way, a lot of the teaching that we've been doing, the church has been calling for this evangelization of the Eucharist, is helping people understand the Eucharist a lot better. And Catholics do understand the meaning of the Eucharist, but there still is a little bit of a lag in people coming to church every Sunday. So some of these emails we've had relate to that lag, and we want to make up for the lag and have everybody there to worship Jesus and receive him in the Holy Mass. All right, I have an email from Tom who lives someplace in the Midwest. That's a big place. Uh, he says, Dear Father Paco, I've spent years avoiding confession because of conflicting opinions on church doctrine about the sacrament. Some priests say confessing mortal sins is the main focus and venial sins to a more casual degree. While well, other priests are adamant that every sin, mortal and venial, venial, must be confessed or else it's a bad confession. Priests online have told me to ask my own confessor his opinion on the matter, which suggests that there is no one solid definition of what makes a good confession. I've, I'm also told that neglecting to mention one sin nullifies the confession of all other sins, even if this sin, according to some opinions, isn't a sin at all. How can I truly be contrite for something that common sense does not see as sinful? And without true contrition, how can it be a good confession? I've given much thought to this in an effort to discern what manner of confession is acceptable to God without falling into the trap of scruples or making a bad confession. Tom in the Midwest. Tom, first of all, what you're describing is a good deal of confusion. This is a confusion that we have inherited from the 70s forward. Um, but 
by pointing out the confusion, we are not really dealing with the problem very well. There are a couple things. First of all, I strongly recommend that you take time to prayerfully go over the catechism. And I would begin with a couple things in the catechism. One, the sacrament, the, the, the section on the sacraments would be one place to begin, especially reflecting on that section about the sacrament of confession. Yes, there are a lot of opinions, but that doesn't mean it's official church teaching. There have been a lot of opinions about who Jesus is. That goes back to the gospel itself. Remember in Matthew 16, our Lord asked the apostles, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they answered, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, uh, some say one of the prophets, some say John the Baptist. Notice they were all wrong. None of those answers were correct. And then he said, who do you all say that I am? And uh, Peter is the one who answered and gave the correct answer. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus recognized that was from the Father. We need to have the same approach to the sacraments. There are a lot of opinions, but we don't base ourselves on these opinions. We go to the church's source of authority. That is absolutely key. And instead of going from one theory to another, take a look at what the church teaches on the sacrament of confession. Now, if, uh, just as an example, if you omit a sin on purpose, especially if it's a uh, mortal sin, then that is a bad confession. That is, you know, it's invalid. Uh, so, you know, you, you you say that's not, not acceptable. You have to confess your mortal sins uh, for sure. And you should confess the venial sins too. Now, should you forget one, you know, that it truly just slipped your mind, then you're, it's considered forgiven. We were taught that back in the 50s. But you can mention it and should mention it the next time you go. And you don't have to go into all the details. I don't want to hear all the details, but you should mention what the sin was and uh, how many times, to the best of your ability to know how many times you did. Especially if it's been a lot of years, you may say that I could, you know, gossiped uh, daily, uh, sometimes more than once daily for the last five years, whatever it is. Um, but you, you, you mention that so that, because that helps the priest get a sense of how to address the sin. It's not about trying to embarrass you. It's trying to understand, well, Father, I, I got drunk. Well, did you get drunk once? Or does this happen three, four, five, six times a week? That makes a difference in terms of what may need to be recommended to you. So it's no small issue. And if you have a problem, you know, with some other habitual sin, you have know, pornography or something like that, that can indicate another kind of difficulty that needs to be addressed. It's to help the priest help you better. And it's not just to, you know, embarrass you. So these are the kinds of things that need to be confessed and by, by number and kind, okay, to the best of your ability. And you don't skip that. And to stay away from confession because all these different confusing opinions. Remember what St. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. God, God is not a God of confusion, but of order. You are allowing the confusion of many people inside the church 
keep you away from this holy sacrament that Jesus gave on the night he rose from the dead when he told the apostles, whosoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. You need to study that. The second part of the catechism you need to take a look at is the part on the Ten Commandments, where it goes through each of the commandments. And it doesn't just say what the commandment is. It gives what the ramifications of those commandments are, how they affect a variety of kinds of sins. So, for instance, stealing includes within it well, bribery. If you're bribing politicians, that is a sin against the seventh commandment. And on and on. You know, th this is where it deals with the ramifications and helps you think through with greater clarity what the sins are and why they are wrong. It's a very important exercise. So you, you can't afford to let these things slide. You can't afford to let confusion reign in your life. It's very important for you to get to the uh, truth of the issue and, uh, and understand better so that not only will you be able to have clarity, but you'll be able to teach others clarity, even if there are priests who aren't clear. You can have clarity that comes from the church, okay? All right. Now let's go over to John. Uh, he says, Father Mitch, I've been considering coming back to the Catholic Church. However, I struggle with the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. One priest has said that Mary was born without sin because God applied the merits of Christ's atonement to her so that she would be sinless and provide Christ with sinless humanity. Yet this commits a serious logical blunder for Mary's birth. Christ's birth and death are events that took place in succession, time, and extended space. For Christ to be born without a sinless body would require applying his own death to Mary prior to his death. Do you see the circular reasoning? Yes, yes, John. And, and, and this is an important uh, issue. One of the things we, we have to pay attention to is that first, God had created Adam and Eve, um, uh, you know, without original sin, okay? And um, this, uh, oh, um, uh, he, he made them, with, gave them original justice before, it, you know, at the beginning of the human race. And the same holy power of God to make Adam and Eve created without original sin is a power that remains with God. He has that power. And when we, before we even take a look at the precise way that God dealt with this, we have to take a look at the facts of Our Lady's Immaculate Conception. First, the angel greets her, hail, one who has been graced. We use the, the uh, English translation of uh, uh, St. Jerome's Latin, uh, 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 you know, where it says, hail, full of grace. Uh, gratia plena. The Greek is kecharitomeni, which means one who has been graced. The importance of, uh, you know, St. Jerome was putting it into idiomatic Latin. Uh, he spoke Greek. He learned Greek from the Greeks, not from textbooks. So he's, he could speak Greek uh, pretty well and as well as translate it. 
And so he gave a good colloquial translation uh, of Gratia Plena. Um, but whether you translate it as one who has been graced or one who is full of grace, the issue is that it is God's grace that is acting within her. And this is, is essential to understand. Secondly, we see that the Holy Spirit enters into Elizabeth at the visitation. St. Luke says that. Uh, the Holy Spirit came upon her. Her child leapt in her womb. And it's, it's a great word, uh, scortize. It's the word for a sheep. Have you ever seen sheep? When they get real excited, they jump up and down. They, 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 all four legs go off the ground. They're so excited. Uh, that's the word for John leaping in the womb. And then Elizabeth speaks three beatitudes to Our Lady. First, uh, blessed are you among women. That's an Aramaic idiom for saying you are the most blessed woman. Aramaic doesn't have the word most. It doesn't exist in their language. So they say, you are blessed among women. That means you're the most blessed woman. If you're more blessed, they say, you are blessed from her. But if you are the most blessed, blessed are you among women. That's standard Semitic uh, idiom in Hebrew, Aramaic, and other Semitic languages. So that's the, first, the second point. She by the power of the Holy Spirit, decrees Mary to be the most blessed woman there is, even more blessed than our mother Eve. And then uh, third, a uh, second blessing is, blessed is the fruit of your womb, referring to Jesus. And then third, blessed is she who believed all that the Lord said to her. Mary had believed that word, and so she's blessed. So those beatitudes, plus the greeting of especially the first beatitude, blessed are you among women, with the greeting of the angel. is no small thing. The Holy Spirit and the angel don't go around schmoozing Our Lady. God doesn't send people to schmooze, but to reveal the truth. And this is very key. Then we see in the Magnificat, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Well, most of us believe that because God is eternal, that the eternal power of his uh, death and resurrection are able to save Mary from sin, including original sin. The Bible doesn't explain it that way. It just has her point out in this revealed word of God that God is her savior and that she is without original sin because God has saved her from it. Whether it's by the same power of that was at creation when God created Adam and Eve without original sin or whether it's by a retroactive a gift from the cross. It's God who has saved her. She didn't save herself. None of us can do that. She's a creature like uh, we are. And, you know, we can't save ourselves. She can't save herself. God is her savior. And she proclaims that. And this, uh, and he has looked down on the lowliness of his maidservant. That's what she proclaims. And this is the basis. Those, those passages are the basis for understanding her being this unique, grace-filled person so that she would have none of the psychoses and neuroses that flow from sin and selfishness and disordered desire. So that's why we have that doctrine. It's a very important one. All right. I need to take another break. We'll come back in just a minute because we still have more emails. So let's take a look at them.
sure to join me tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time for EWTN Live. And we'll talk with professor and author Paul Kengor to discuss the church's bold and divine opposition to slavery. So a very important discussion and should be very informative. Okay. All right. Let's now take a look at another email. This is from Vince in the great state of Minnesota. Dear Father Mitch, I have a friend who is involved in same-sex marriage. Their anniversary was weeks ago, and I wanted to wish them a happy anniversary, but I didn't because I felt that if I did, that would mean I support same-sex marriage and it would be, become my sin as well. Did I do the right thing, or could I wish them a happy anniversary? Vince, Minnesota. Um, Vince, you know, we don't believe that that's marriage. Uh, Pope Francis has been very clear on this uh, as this issue has been coming up, that marriage is between one man and one woman uh, with a life commitment open to bringing new life into the world. Um, this is the definition of, uh, or the requirements of marriage. Now, you know, that doesn't mean that you dislike your friends. They're your friends, and you love them. And in fact, um, there are ways to show that you love them without indicating that you approve of this decision. Uh, you can be kind to them and show them the, the, the friendship uh, that you have without, you know, you know, congratulating them for something that isn't what we believe to be real marriage. So what I would do is, you know, find some other way to, you know, show your love for them. And in fact, you know, oftentimes indicating that you reject them and dislike them and will accept them only on condition that they stop this. That drives them farther into this lifestyle very frequently. Um, I would find ways to, to just show that you love them without giving approval for their, their situation. That's the same kind, it's a, a related problem to people who move in together, sometimes stay together for a number of years. They want to celebrate an anniversary. Uh, we've, been to, we've been together for five years, but you're not married. Is that, that We don't accept that. Um, same for this. This is a very important uh, thing that we want to show love and concern for them without, you know, supporting the irregularity. And this takes a wise social negotiation. And, some, and there are times where you simply have to say, nope, I can't do anything about this. You know, I have to stay away. But as much as you can show them your, your friendship and care and be a bridge that can open them back to this life in Christ and the life of the sacraments, you can seek to do that. Sometimes you have to be sort of quiet and not say much. Other times you can say a little bit more. Um, look for those opportunities with wisdom and careful observation rather than jumping into one thing or the other, looking for that. Okay? All right. Then we have a question from Maria in Staten Island, New York. It says, Hello, Father Paco. I have a question about salvation. If someone lives his or her life in Jesus' image, doing works, acts of charity, leading an honest, forthright life, but does not go to Mass and does not go to confession, can he go to heaven? Maria from Staten Island. First of all, Maria, 
uh, this person is going to be judged, not by you or by me, but by Christ. And what, there's some things that you want to find out. What's going on that they are not go, uh, joining in worship of God in the church? This is something that the scripture wants us to do. This is part of revelation. And it's not just my desire or your desire to have them at church as if we're part of a club that we want them to join. This is something that you see, for instance, in Hebrews, I think it's chapter 13. Do not neglect the weekly meetings. You know, this is very important to be there and keep holy the Sabbath as part of it. And what, again, and as far as whether they'll go to heaven or hell, I'll leave that up to God to decide in their heart. My task and your task will be to look for those opportunities. Again, you can't always just jump in there and say, how come you're not going to church? Sometimes you can, sometimes not. But you can, depending on how you know them, you can find ways to ask them about their attendance at church. That would be a very good thing. And I would highly recommend that. Um, but look for the opportunities to bring it up. And you have to sometimes just sit and watch and wait and pray to our Lord. Lord, open up the possibility for me to talk to them about coming back to church because we want them there. And the church needs them. And they need the church both ways. That's the way I would approach this and always leave the judgment up to God. All right, now we have an email from Susanna. Hello, Father. Please answer a particular question I have on the transubstantiation moment in the Mass. I see the large host and the wine being consecrated by the celebrant. However, I do not see the bowl of host for the congregation. That bowl come, seems to come out of the tabernacle at the time of communion. I know that the miracle extends into the tabernacle as well, but how? But why is the bowl of hosts for the congregation not on the altar to be blessed as well? Please correct my observation if, need, uh, if needed. Susanna. Well, Susanna, first of all, the priest does not consecrate the hosts that are in the tabernacle. He can only consecrate the hosts that are on the altar. It's not as if his word of consecration just sort of goes to any bread in the room. Rather, here's the situation. The uh, bowl, you call it, it's uh, normally called a ciborium. It's a, a specific word, uh, ciborium. Uh, that has all those hosts in the tabernacle was consecrated at an earlier mass and was left over. So those are the hosts consecrated at an earlier time, and we don't we can't throw them away. You know that we don't do that. We because it's the body of Christ, we reserve those hosts in the tabernacle and you consume those before you consecrate more hosts. So that's what's going on. And usually uh, they consecrate um, at mass, the, the mass where they're used. But if there are hosts already available or say there was some ceremony and there are a lot of extra hosts left over, then the priest won't consecrate more of the small hosts during the Mass. He'll simply bring out the ones that are already consecrated. So they are already consecrated. The transubstantiation already has taken place at another Eucharist, 
and they are simply uh, you know, using those up before they consecrate another ciborium full of hosts. Okay? And then we have one from Tad from West Haven, Connecticut. Father Packle, I am a 52-year-old lifelong Catholic. For most of my life, I was the bare minimum Catholic, baptism, first Holy communion, confirmation, weekly mass. A Sunday Catholic, you would say, but not much else in between Monday and Saturday. It wasn't until my 40s that I felt an unrelenting pull to learn more, to do more, and grow in my relationship with the Lord as a gut-wrenching to state what is the truth. So I was going, doing some deeper reading about Advent and its history, and I saw the blog on EWTN calling Advent the other penitential season. It stated that Catholics with long memories remember that Advent once contained fast days, and in some countries, Christmas Eve was a fast day. Can you expound, Father Tad from West Haven? Yes, this is something that uh, I remember. As a matter of fact, we weren't allowed to have meat on uh, Christmas Eve. So at my grandmother's house, we always had fish and um, uh, you, know, other, you know, a few other dishes that she made just for that meal. And dessert was fairly simple. She made the chushik, which was fried dough with a little bit of powdered sugar on it. Uh, we rarely had those any other day, but it was a simple kind of dessert. And we saved the big Christmas meal for Christmas Day. And the idea is that uh, people fast and abstain during Advent in order to have a, a, a better sense of helping to enter into the longing for Christ. Advent is four weeks to commemorate the 4,000 years from creation to Christ in the biblical counting. And that we want to create that longing and so that the, uh, uh, the, it's a period of minor fasting and abstaining. It's not like Lent, but it, it's, so it's not so much focused just on repentance of sin, but on you know, longing for Christ to come, uh, like, like the, the minor uh, notes in O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, express longing. That's what we want to do with that prayer and fasting, express longing. All right. Well, we've run out of time. May the Lord bless you all and keep you, fill you with his wisdom and knowledge. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, we can bring you this show and all the other programs we do only because this network is brought to you by you. That's how our Lord inspired Mother Angelica instead of getting commercial ads and such. So please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all of our bills too. God bless you all and keep you. Thank you.